So, uh, William, welcome to Knowledge of Wharton. Uh, you've been with uh, Estee Lauder for 27 years. For five years, you served as chief executive. For three years now, you've been executive chair. Looking back on your career of the company, you've made hundreds of decisions, took dozens of big actions. Which of those decisions or actions uh, at the moment looking back make you most proud? You know, I wish I could say there was any one decision that makes me most proud. There's a series of cumulative decisions and you can build from one to the other. Um, going back almost 20 years now, we made a decision to, we were always in the business of building our own brands. And we felt that if we couldn't invent it, if it wasn't invented by us, it wasn't a good idea. And we saw this brand called Mac. And Mac was a brand created by uh, two people in Canada and they came up with an idea that was really good. And um, we said, you know what? Maybe we're gonna buy instead of build. And that really opened our eyes to a whole nother way of how we managed our business and our portfolio of brands. And we shifted from being solely an invent it and create it and market it to we are a network company, which is this extensive network of distribution and expertise in aspirational beauty. And now we become agnostic about whether we're the authors of the brand or the acquirers of the brand. We had to go through the discipline of, it's a very different discipline. Building has high, relatively low cost to entry, relatively higher risks to success. Buying, much higher cost of entry, lower risk to success. So balancing that in our portfolio and our mind was very transformative for our company really ever since. That was a big, major change in our decision making. As a corollary to that, we started doing licensing and fragrances. For, first was Tommy Hilfiger, then Donna Karen, and now many others too. And that also changed our philosophy of what kind of company we were and what we were going to become as a company. The upshot of that was is it really changed us. Even though today 90% of our revenues come from efforts that we've made. Most of our acquisitions represent 30% of our global sales but 90% of the revenues of those acquisitions come from while well, those brands were part of our portfolio. So we've added a great deal of value um, to or for our shareholders to, and productivity for these companies. But it's changed the way we think about our company, how we manage our company strategically, how we allocate our resources, and how we think about what we're gonna be in the next 20 years. Great, and William, we'd love to dive a little bit into your decision-making process. Can you tell us a bit about maybe the toughest decision you've ever faced as a leader? What were the options, how you thought it through, and, and then how it played out? Well, uh, you know, it's sort of, Adam, this sort of follows on to the Mac question, which is we had a brand which was created in the late 1970s called Prescriptives. And Prescriptives was forward for its time, and it was sort of the emotional, intellectual underpinning of what has now become the makeup artist brands. And their position was exact skincare, exact makeup. And um, Prescriptives was doing extremely well. And at one point, we had an option to invest in Mac at a much earlier stage in its development. And we were looking at Prescriptives growing rapidly. And we said, no, mon that money invested in Prescriptives will give us a better return than Mac. Ha ha, 20 years later, that wouldn't have been the case at all. Because essentially, we euthanized our own brand. First, we bought Mac, then we bought Bobby Brown. And over a period of time, the Prescriptives brand lost its mojo. It lost its upward momentum for any number of reasons. And we were holding on to the brand from a competitive strategy standpoint because our retail partners had supported the brand for many years. It occupied good real estate, was doing a decent business, wasn't losing money, wasn't making money. So there's a capital cost involved of preserving the space for the next big idea we might have. So we could afford the rent, the effective rent of less productivity because it cost more to close it than it did to keep it going. The recession of 2008, nine came along and that changed the dynamics dramatically. And all of a sudden the rent tripled. The rent for occupying the space tripled and the brand's productivity was, went down dramatically and there was a lot of downward pressure and sales in a lot of places and we could no longer tolerate a loss maker to, for a future opportunity. 
And so we had to make the decision whether we were going to continue to invest in supporting this brand and paying the rent or whether we said, no, we're not going to do it. So we had to close the brand. And that's very emotional. It's like hiving off an arm or a leg. Um, as a percent of sales, it wasn't really, really meaningful. We could afford it. But the real issue was, is you're saying, okay, something we created, something we've enjoyed for over 30 years, it's time for it to go. So we had loyal consumers who we had to look after. How are we going to transfer them to, with the products that they love to another brand and tell them you're going to love them just as much? How are we going to take care of the employees who've been dedicated and loyal to this brand? How are we going to deal with our trade, with our retail partners who've been supporting this brand because of their trust in us? What were we going to offer them for our saying, look, we're no longer going to be in this business? Since we had to continue to be in business with these retailers, we couldn't just turn around and say, sorry, guys, we're out. So that was a very difficult, long, somewhat painful process. And today, the brand exists only online. It's a fraction of itself, but it exists and has the core key SKUs that has a, have a loyal following, which they can only find online. Um, maybe waiting someday to come back again in a, in a brick and mortar world, but for the moment, that's all that's left of it. And uh, the impact on the people, the impact on our trade, the impact on us strategically was not easy. Um, but we don't look back with regret saying, gee, we could have done it differently. William, we're going to turn a little bit more personal now. And as we think about leadership, your leadership style shares many uh, attributes or capacities, or you're on a platform that's not all that different from people who lead other companies. But every leader also brings a unique blend of the way you approach problems or think about the business. Could you give us an illustration that somehow brings out your more unique approach to leading at Estee Lauder? You know, um, I'm much more comfortable allowing others in our organization to take the credit for success. My enthusiasm comes from seeing them succeed and achieve their objectives. And my goal has always been to motivate them, encourage them, and actively push them to their success. Um, I'll sort of use an analogy. There are times in the nature of our business where sometimes the people in our organization felt they needed permission to be as good as they could be. And one of the things I did is I said, you don't ever need permission to be your best and do your best and compete at your best. You actually need the opposite. You need permission to not try hard and you're expected to try hard every day. So when I had the um, Clinique brand, and I took over the leadership of the Clinique brand, Clinique had always perceived itself to be the younger sibling of the SD Lauder brand, but they were on a roll. They were really in a zone from a product positioning standpoint, from a pricing positioning standpoint, on a sweet spot of a demographic, and they were doing very well. And one of the things they saw was is that they were rapidly overtaking their sister brand, Estee Lauder, and a number of other competitors. And the woman who was in charge of the sales organization in North America, a very energetic, enthusiastic organization led by a very, very capable leader, she came in and she said, look, this is what we see. This is how we're going to work. But she said... I need your permission that it's okay not only for us to overpay, overtake our sister in share and sales, but to celebrate it. And I said, why do you ask? Of course you do. You must. I insist. And I said, well, why would you think? She goes, well, you know, everyone's very reluctant. And, and I said, no, go. And she said, well, your name is Lauder. I said, I don't care what my name is. I only care that you're doing the very best that you possibly can. Go for it, guys. And so one of the things I started doing is my office at the time was right outside where the main conference rooms were. So there was a lot of action around my office all the time. So I started talking using symbols for the way I felt about the way we look. And I get up in front of the group, the whole group, you know, the 200 people and say, guys, I want you to imagine there's only one place we're going to look at our competition. 
It's going to be in the rearview mirror, and I want those headlights getting smaller and smaller every single day. I said, that's the only place you can see your competition. And I said, you know why? And everyone says, no. I said, because if you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. So I put up on the sort of the counter in front of where my assistant sits, put an oversized rear view mirror that had Clinique on it and with two little pinholes. So, so it's simple. Hey, I keep saying you want us, the only place you're going to see that. There it was for everyone to see when they were going into the meetings in the conference room. And I couldn't find an appropriate poster or sign about a lead dog that wasn't going to have the, the behind of a husky or something. And I didn't think that would be appropriate. Um, but I have found over time, but by using analogies and encouraging success and celebrating the success of our teams, that everyone seems motivated and hungry. William, continuing on the personal note, as you look back on your career, is there an experience or a mentor who has most shaped your view of what effective leadership involves? The Treasury, I believe, to become chief of staff uh, to the president. And he was a very straightforward, matter of fact, smart, accomplished um, uh, executive. And one of the first things he said to me was, if you're not in control of your calendar, you're not in control. And I've used that as a mantra to constantly look at what I'm doing, where I'm going, and how I'm doing it, to try my level best to be in control, to try to say, I will allocate this time for these meetings. And I know now, in the, and from, from a leadership standpoint, a lot of my effectiveness is my presence, physically being there, encouraging, supportive, and adding input. It's not just the contribution you make by participating in an email trail or re reading and analyzing. It's about the leadership presence of being in front. So I know there are times when I'm, I gotta be there and you have to multiply yourself and be in many places simultaneously or it may mean you're going around the world for a two day meeting, for two days because you gotta be there to both respect somebody who would, who's honored by your time and presence and motivate them for the time you've given them. And I've learned that from politicians. I've learned that from effective executives. I've learned from, my father was a wonderful executive who taught me a lot. When I worked at Macy's, I learned from some executives who were very effective and I learned some from executives who weren't so effective. Oftentimes I learned about saying, oh geez, when I get to a position of leadership, I'll never do that. And this is something I'll, I'll make sure I avoid. I've learned from people who have, I have worked for me in ways that are innumerable because of the way they've responded. Sometimes they respond very well to certain ways that I've tried to lead them and say, aha, this works. What makes this work? Sometimes I've learned it because I've tried stuff that hasn't worked, that wasn't me, or wasn't the way I get the most out of somebody. I remember once I was a mid-level executive at Macy's and um, one of my sales managers was, you know, I just was frustrated. They weren't getting stuff done the way I wanted to get done. And for whatever reason, I sort of tried to do it now, whatever, you know, sort of a hard approach. And she had this look on her face like, what are you doing? I went away, I turned around and came back about three minutes later, took her aside and I said, look, I'm really sorry for speaking to you that way. That's not me. I know I upset you. I did the wrong thing. Period, end of story. I'm sorry. I said, that being said, what, do we, what can I do to help you get this done because we still gotta make sure it's done. She said, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. It'll get done now. And I don't think I've ever yelled again at work because I didn't feel good about it, didn't get great result, didn't motivate anybody, did the wrong thing. Period, end of story. I'm sorry. I said, that being said, what, do we, what can I do to help you get this done because we still gotta make sure it's done. She said, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. It'll get done now. And I don't think I've ever yelled again at work. 
because I didn't feel good about it, didn't get great result, didn't motivate anybody. I'm going to pick up on that. It's often said that learning leadership is a, it's a lifelong process. Two-part question here. Looking back on your career, what do you know now that you didn't know about leadership when you were in a, in a more junior position? And then as part of that, as you've thought about leadership that you now exercise and see around you, compared to what you thought was critical for leadership, let's say 15 or 20 years ago, what turns out to be wrong that you thought might have been true about leadership back then, but with experience, turns out to be not correct? I've learned to better meter how and where you push and communicate and don't, and also how to really set priorities that are important. I think when I was a young executive, whatever the task in front of me was the most important task. And I almost wasn't thinking of items two, three, or four, number one, or whether or not there were eggs or egos broken along the way to get that task done. I have now feel more confident in a little bit of patience, one. Two, everybody has the priority list, but everyone, not everyone's priority list lines up with mine. So first job is to line them up with my priority list or understand why we're not aligned and how we're going to get into alignment. It's not my alignment, it's not your alignment, it's our alignment. Because if I'm pushing my items one to three, but oh, by the way, my item three is your item five, and your item one is not even on my top ten, we got a problem. I don't think it's my problem. I don't think it's your problem. We have a problem. So I first learned all about communication and alignment, get everyone in the same order of priorities, and now let's figure out how we can accomplish it. That I've sort of learned. The wisdom of time has taught me that. You just got to get it done, got to get it done. You can't think of how it's going to take to get done and that the how you get it done, how long it's going to take done, but the how you get it done is important so that the next time you go back, it's easier still and it's easier still. Just a quick follow-up. Looking back, was there something a few years back you thought should characterize how you're going to lead, which with experience turns out to be a false proposition? You know, there was a time and I there was a time when extraordinary knowledge of data in and of itself seemed to be the be all and end all. And I would spend hours pouring through pages and pages and pages of data, running my finger across, running it down, looking for the anomalies, and then trying to probe the whys and the wherefores. And I learned over a fairly significant period of time that it's the most of the whys and the wherefores are about people. Most of that, those people were about motivating and focusing. And being really, really persistent in and of itself to the point of not letting it, letting go can be debilitating for an organization because that's all they're going to focus on. And occasionally you need to be that way. Occasionally for really key important things, but not the only thing. And I used to spend a lot, I used to spend a lot more time than I do now visiting stores throughout the world and throughout the United States and I used to love it, love it. I still enjoy it. I just don't do it as much as I used to. And, you know, I'd get into the car, and whoever the regional executive was would be driving the car, and she'd have a book there, and I'd be sitting in the driver's seat, in the, in the passenger seat of the car, going through the book, going down, going through, so tell me about this, tell me about this. Why is this business good? Why isn't this business good? What can we do to make it better? While she's driving. And uh, my sales manager says to me one day, you know how nervous you make these people as they're driving and you're going to talk about the business and there you are pouring through their business door by door by door and they've got to pay attention to get off on exit 12. Simultaneously, they've got to give you an intelligent answer and make sure they don't get into an accident with you in the passenger seat. I said, yeah, I get it. That's a good point. And she goes, I'm not telling you not to do it, but just, she said, lay off a little bit, let them drive and talk about their business and you've got time to quiz them later. And so, you know, I learned this sort of 
that hard driving, you know, detail oriented manager's approach may work for some or may work for some in certain roles. But as you move on in leadership, that skill set in and of itself isn't enough if you aren't also sensitive and don't have that high emotional IQ that'll get people motivated to really do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Final question for today. If you think about offering advice to new leaders, what are the two or three most important things you'd want them to know? Need in your support to do a really good job. What is it that you need to do to get them from being really good to excellent? And what is the thoughts? What are the motivations? When do you know when it's time for you to be in the lead breaking trail, when it's time to allow them to break trail? And by all means, you got to know when's the time to step aside and let them take the praise that they need in your support to do a really good job. What is it that you need to do to get them from being really good to excellent? And what is the thoughts? What are the motivations? When do you know when it's time for you to be in the lead breaking trail? when it's time to allow them to break trail. And by all means, you got to know when's the time to step aside and let them take the praise. Great. Thank you for joining Thanks. us today. Thank you.